Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Good morning. And welcome to the 2017 Deborah L. Spunt Lecture, generously funded by Lairdall Medical. I'm Mary Ann Rizzolo, and I had the privilege of working with Deb Spunt on the um, uh, initial NLN Lairdall simulation research project headed up by Pam Jeffries. In 2007, when Tor Lairdall learned that Debbie was gravely ill, he generously offered to fund this lecture in her memory and to celebrate the pioneering efforts she made in simulation. Debbie was thrilled when I went to tell her about this honor. When I asked who should deliver the first uh, Spunt lecture, she said, Pam, of course. And it's fitting that Pamela Jeffries in, uh, uh, nominated this year's Spunt lecture, Dr. Kathy Lassiter. Kathy is a professor at Oregon Health and Sciences University. She was a member of the original Oregon Consortium for Nursing Education Committee, fondly known as ACNI, that uh, advocated for incorporating simulation as a significant um, element of that curriculum. The ACNI model, implemented across the state of Oregon, has also served as a model for other states who wish to incorporate a statewide uh, simula uh, nursing education agenda. Dr. Lassiter began her study of the development of pre-licensure nursing students' clinical judgment, or thinking like a nurse, in early 2004. The primary outcome of her research was the Lassiter Clinical Judgment Rubric, which is widely recognized as a valid and reliable tool for evaluating learners' clinical judgment in simulation. <clears throat> her research uh, many people, uh, over 500 in fact, both uh, from institutions and individuals, have requested the use of that research. And it's been, uh, articles have quoted this, the use of her research in 12 languages and in journals in Korea, Sweden, and Portugal. The last, the Lassiter, Dr. Lassiter has grown her program of research into six multi-site and international studies, and she's currently PI on a large international study with an N of 536. That'll be pretty generalizable, the results of that one. Uh, she's using a pre-recorded simulation scenario to explore students' backgrounds and the impact on their clinical judgment. Kathy has um, published widely and has given numerous presentations on her work She's been invited to teach in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, and Japan. And she's received numerous awards, including the Distinguished Faculty Award for Outstanding Teaching from Oregon Health and Sciences University, her home school. Earlier this year, she received a Fulbright Award to conduct research in Edinburgh at Napier University in Scotland and I can personally attend, attest to Kathy's generosity in sharing her wisdom and expertise with others as they pursue their work. Please welcome Kathy Lassiter. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to the National League for Nursing and to Lairdall for sponsoring this event and for selecting me as this year's Spunt Award winner. Um, I, as you all know, simulation is a team sport and many of you have contributed to my own growth and hopefully it's been a reciprocal process. But I'm very excited to be here today and I'm very excited that there are some of you in the audience who may not be on the simulation bandwagon or really think you have anything to do with simulation at this point because I've got a message for you too. First of all, let me br uh, bring greetings to you from Portland, Oregon, where we have not seen the mountain this clearly in over a month now because of the forest fires. 
but this fo photo was taken on the top of a hill in Portland where our school is. I, I teach at Oregon Health and Science University, as Marianne mentioned, and it's a large medical uh, research campus. And we, but we have five geographic campuses all around the state and another uh, virtual campus. So we are a big, big institution. But our main campus is in Portland, and that's where I teach. Many, I should say many of my colleagues are here today and or have been here in the last couple of days. So um, it's re really been wonderful. You know, I don't know about you, but when I come to a conference, I get more contact with my colleagues at a conference than I do when I'm at home, which is <laughs> really kind of an amazing thing, isn't it? So for those of you who don't know me or who may not know some of these uh, special facts, I thought I'd just share a little bit with you. Um, first of all, I've been an educator since childhood in the sense that my mother always told me I should be a teacher because I was so bossy. <laughs> so now you know that about me. Um, I've been a nurse for over 45 years. I cannot believe, I don't know where the time has gone, frankly. I've always questioned things and that questioning was brought to full fruition and I felt fully enabled in my doctoral work, which I began at age 53. There's a message for some of you in that statement. Um, and became what I consider to be a pioneer in simulation research. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that and why I think I'm a pioneer and what was going on in that time. But more importantly, I've become an advocate and a huge champion for simulation um, in my role as an educator. Of course, as educator, we all have to have session outcomes, right? And these are mine for this session. I hope that you'll be able, by the end of the session, to talk a little bit about new graduate nurses' learning needs. And this is where you all come in, whether you're in simulation or not. Recognize how moments in simulation's history have impacted your teaching. Consider your role in simulation moving forward. And in keeping with the theme of our conference, the community of colleagues, this idea of develop a beginning plan for coming together right now. You may have noticed the Beatles on my first slide. Um, I, I wasn't much of a rocker, but this song was absolutely perfect for this occasion, so you'll hear it more later. So let's start. First of all, graduation is my favorite day of the year because this is the day we get to celebrate the accomplishments of our students that we've worked so hard with, and we are joyful with them as they begin their careers and as they begin to move outside of our institution and into their practice areas. But it occurs to me that sometimes we say goodbye to them on that day and then we really don't know totally what happens to them. Maybe some of you know, but I really didn't know what happened to them. So I want to share a little bit about what I've learned about new graduate nurses through some research of my own. This has actually become a focus of my research in the last five years, our new graduate nurses, because as ac academic educators, and I'm hoping there's some practice educators out in the audience as well, but as academic educators, I think we need to know what our students are facing when they leave and become new graduates and colleagues. Oops, wrong way here. So there's this frightening statistic um, that only 10% of hospital and health system nurse executives believe their new graduate nurses are fully ready to practice. And I can tell you that the same article talks about the fact that 10 uh, um, Nurse educators, academic nurse educators, believe that 90% of their new graduates are ready for practice. So it's a complete flip. So there's a, there's a gap there, right? <laughs> a few years back, some of us at OHSU did a homegrown study at our hospital looking at new hires. And we examined, the, the hospital was concerned about new hires' clinical judgment. They were done with ch skills checklists, yay. Um, they felt pretty confident that their, uh, their new graduates knew how to do the skills or they had the, the raw materials with which to learn the skills. But they were more concerned about their clinical judgment. And so they took the rubric that I developed and changed it up a little bit to become a scoring tool that would work for them. And what we learned was that, and this was very surprising to us, that we, we expected that those under a year of experience perhaps didn't have, uh, weren't operating at full clinical judgment. But even those from one to three years were not operate with one to three years experience were not operating with full clinical judgment. It was really the three to six years of experience nurses that had the highest scores in clinical judgment. And I guess there's a couple of implications here. First of all, um, I would say to those of you who are practice educators, our new graduates apparently at this time need more support than three to six weeks 
of orientation and onboarding. Um, but for us in the academic world, maybe we need to look at our learning strategies and teaching strategies and think about how can we better prepare our students? It's clear they lack experience, that we know, but how can we help them gain more experience? Janet Monagol of the Boston area and I have just recently finished a study and it's about to be published in Nursing Education Perspectives, um, where we had two groups of new graduate nurses. Uh, and when I say groups, we were actually at four different hospitals, East Coast, West Coast, and had a treatment group and a control group, and worked with the treatment group on this issue of clinical judgment, what some of the issues were that folks were facing in practice, in that first year of practice. And what we learned was, when we administered the health sciences reasoning test at the beginning of that first year of practice and at the end of the first year of practice, we saw no change whatsoever, either in the treatment group or in the control group. So in fact, that first year of experience seems to have been a way of a time of finding their way. And we found out after the fact, or as we examined our qualitative notes, lots of emotional teeter-tottering. And so I offer this. We, they, the students, uh, students, they weren't students, they were new graduate nurses, told us at the end of their first year that they were teeter-tottering between frustration and confidence, sometimes on a daily and even an hourly basis, all the time. As time went by, they were getting to be more confident, but they still experienced frustrations. And these were the areas that emerged as themes from this study, that they were experiencing their frustrations and confidence. And these are not going to be surprising to you, but what I'm going to suggest to you, just to kind of plant a seed in your mind, is that perhaps these four areas are the areas where we need to focus more in our academic programs and where perhaps simulation can be helpful. Because as you know, going to the clinical area is, as my colleague Paula Gebrud House says, a random access opportunity, right? We don't know what they're gonna get that day. But in simulation, we know what they're going to get because we planned the experience. So I um, want to propose to you that these four areas might be something we want to look at more in depth in the future. Let me just give you an example that it kind of encompasses all of them. We learned from the new graduate nurses at, their end of the first, at the end of their first year that many of them were able to figure out what was going on with their patients and to know uh, when things were going south, when things were decompensating but they didn't always know what the next step was. And so we began to think about this, and we began to think, well, we teach SBAR, most of us. We certainly practice it in simulation, but what we learned was that those students, those new graduate nurses, weren't getting to the R part in their programs of study. They weren't getting to that recommendation part of SBAR. And I would challenge those of you, and well, all of us, really, to really help our students take that next step. They were great with the situation. They understood the background. They could do a fine assessment, but then what to do with that? How to talk to the medical team, the healthcare team, about what the recommendation should be? And so I challenge you to help our students get there, to get to that recommendation, because this is what the, the new graduate nurses were telling us. We don't know what to do next. We know something needs to be done. We just don't know what it is. For those of you who are interested in knowing more, poster number seven at lunchtime. Have a visit. And then there's this. And I'm not meaning to be negative at all. I just think that these are things that we can attend to and really, um, and really work hard for our, our graduate nurses. This was actually published in Nursing Education um, uh, Perspectives earlier this year. 23% of new graduate nurses scored at a safe or acceptable level for practice using the proprietary, proprietary system of PBDS. That means that 67% did not reach a safe or acceptable level. And that's frightening, really frightening. So I don't know about you, but in 1974, Marlene Kramer, who used to be at the University of California, San Francisco, where I got my master's degree, and this is the year I started my master's degree, a nurse of three years talked about this thing called reality shock. I still have the book on my shelf, published in 1974. It's now 42 years later, and I'm talking to you about reality shock. So folks, we need to do something. <laughs> and you're, you're in a great position to help make, this, uh, make a difference. Obviously, there's a lot of things about healthcare that have changed in 42 years. The whole role of nursing has changed in 42 years. If I were doing today what I was doing 42 years ago, I wouldn't still be in nursing, trust me. 
But anyway, many of you weren't even born 42 years ago, so <laughs> we can talk about that later. So my question to you is, how can we help our students transition more smoothly into practice? They deserve this. They've worked hard to become nurses. And yet that reality shock is there waiting for them. And it sometimes drives some of them out of the profession, which we really don't want to have happen after we've spent so much time and energy and they've done so well. Well, I'm proposing to you, right in line with what Dr. Malone talked about yesterday and the theme of the conference, that really what it's about is partnerships and collaboration of our colleagues and simulation. So let's talk a little bit about this. I'm, I'm going to ask you to indulge me in a short trip down memory lane uh, about simulation and sort of think with me about the history of simulation and how it has become its own science. because. 14 years ago, when I began in this field, there was no science. So this is my journey. 2003, 2004 was the perfect storm, uh, not to take away from the imperfect storms we've experienced recently in our country, but uh, this was when the Oregon Consortium for Nursing Education was fully into planning its new curriculum. We were introducing simulation and case-based studies at, um, at OHSU and in the entire state because our consortium is an entire state um, effort. Chris Tanner, who happened to be my colleague and at that time the person to whom I reported, um, had already drafted a copy of Thinking Like a Nurse, the article that many of you have read and is what I would consider a sentinel article. Um, and she sat across the table from me and from her drawer pulled out a sheaf of papers just encrusted with ink and uh, coffee and turned up corners, and that was the draft to thinking like a nurse. And she looked at me and she said, if you're interested in how students are learning to think, then read this and let me know if it resonates with you. Well, of course it did, and the rest is history. But that was what I was thinking about for my dissertation. And so all of these things were converging at the same time. It was an amazing time. So let me just take you back to 2003, 2004. There was a minuscule amount, I love that word, of research at that time about simulation. Most of it was actually came from the medical field, from anesthesiology. They were the first adopters, pretty much, in healthcare of simulation. There was a concern among faculty, us, that maybe this was just the next big thing. It would come, it would go. And where would we be then with all this expensive equipment, right? That was a concern. And I would say that that resulted in a fair amount of resistance. And I'm ashamed to say on parts of some of us um, in this room, perhaps. My early research was actually taking Tanner's model of clinical judgment and developing uh, these dimensions to determine a trajectory of development for uh, nursing students in terms of how they could begin to learn to think like a nurse. And that then became uh, the rubric which some of you are familiar with and is widely available now as Marianne mentioned. But there was another part to my research and that was that I wanted to know, since this was the very first term that we had offered simulation in our program, I wanted to know what the students thought about it. What did, I mean, we were fumbling our way through, I can tell you, I sat through 53 simulations in seven weeks. So I really inundated myself, and that was to come up with the rubric, but the, um, I wanted to sit with students afterwards and find out, what do you think about this thing about simulation, and what can we do better with it, and what does it do for us? And they were very honest, as you might expect, as students often are, and honestly, the number one comment that they came up with had to do with this very first line that simulation was a key to integrating all of their learning from the classroom, from their reading, from the clinical, from skills labs. This was the thing that brought it all together. Some of them mentioned the fact that their clinical experiences were only on one kind of floor working with a specialty population, and simulation allowed them to expand their experience and their exposure to different kinds of populations. They reported the idea of heightened anticipation and awareness in their, themselves. That is, they were wondering what was going to happen next, which of course they still do. But that idea of thinking ahead was something kind of new for our students, and that was a wonderful thing to see. And of course, they identified that debriefing was where the real learning took place. 
And I guess I'm thinking that not much has changed in the last uh, uh, 13, 14 years. Is that your imp impression? But what I walked away with, just a moment here, was this idea that as an educator, I saw simulation's potential as a fantastic pedagogy. First of all, I saw it being an engaging tool that got everybody going. It engaged or it used all the learning styles that Kolb was describing. Mind you, this is my, these are my thoughts from 2004, so a lot has happened in the meantime. That whole idea of protecting patients while students were learning was a huge thing. We wanted to do that. The debriefing was focused on reflection, and Tanner would say that reflection is really the part of, um, of clinical judgment where the learning happens. Without reflection, we don't have learning. And it provided us feedback with where we had learning gaps or understanding gaps. I'll never forget um, the students who uh, gave a, a medication and then didn't go back and reassess after they gave the medication to find out what, uh, like, I think it was morphine, you know, to this uh, simulated patient, and we asked them why they didn't do that. We, well, we already assessed. So we thought, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board and understand that the students don't really understand the concept of assessment being an ongoing process. Shortly after we uh, began using simulation in our courses, we actually, um, offered us a continuing education course at our school because we had become recognized as a school that um, was doing simulation well early on. We were early adopters. And these were the kinds of questions that were coming up at that time. I'm talking 2006, I believe, was our first, our first course. How do we get administrators to pay for the simulation equipment? Where can we get training for simulation specialists and sim techs? And how to get faculty buy-in? And how do we know that simulation is effective? And is there a place in practice settings for simulation? Now, in some parts of the country, practice settings might have been the first to start with simulation. In our part of the world, it was definitely academic programs. So these were the questions that were coming to us. And perhaps the most important question was, is this finally the way that we can evaluate clinical expertise and competence? Along the way, we often heard confessions, confessions about simulation and box people. because those who had the simulation resources hadn't yet taken Lairdahl's fine training course, or they were terrified to take the, the mannequin out of the box, turn it on, and see how to work it. And I mean, there were just all kinds of reports of box people. So I would say to you, we do have evidence that simulation is, is an effective pedagogy. And for those of you who are still on the fence about that, I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll really be on the bandwagon with us. But we, first of all, we have the NLN Jeffries um, uh, simulation framework, which then um, over time gathered evidence and became such a helpful tool in planning simulations and eventually became a theory. And Pam and the NLN Lairdahl have really done a lot of work in terms of providing that support for us all. I have to tell you a story, and I'm sorry Pam isn't here. I believe I've shared this story with her. It's not an embarrassing thing at all, but it's uh, uh, NLN Summit in 2007 was being held in Phoenix, and I remember it well because our kids were living in Phoenix at the time, and they had picked us up at the airport, were taking us to their house. We were going to stay with them. We were sitting in the back seat, and all of a sudden I got a phone call, and the phone call was from Tasmania, of all places which is an island off of the, I mean, it's part of Australia, but it's an island off of the main part of Australia. And they wanted to know if I was qualified, mind you, I was an assistant professor at this time, I had just finished my, my doctoral work, I had just published my first article, the rubric wasn't even published yet, and here we were, they were asking if I um, could possibly consider coming to Tasmania to be part of the university there as a professor, a full professor. I said, not me. Uh, <laughs> And in 2007, I had to think about it a little bit to, f to figure out, is there anybody I know who would be ready to be a full professor uh, in simulation, not to mention in Tasmania? And the only person that I could come up with was Pam Jeffries, and who, who was probably not a professor yet at that point in her life either. But I mentioned Pam to them. I, meant, I told them how to get in touch with her. And clearly, to our benefit, uh, Pam did not accept the job in Tasmania. <laughs> 
We have journals and we have research galore. It used to be when I taught that CE course the first time that I could put all of the um, references for the course, anything, any kind of research study about simulation went on one sheet of paper, front and back. Well, now we have journals, we have articles. These are two of our best journals that we use all the time. Um, there are at least 10 English-speaking journals or newsletters about simulation now, so you can see we're long gone beyond the one page uh, of citations. We have best practices, we have organizations, we have conferences. Uh, now there's an academy, so there's all kinds of ways that we recognize those who have contributed to simulation science. And I would say the proof is in the pudding. We have expanded uh, applications of simulation to show for ourselves. And this has been probably the most fun part about being involved even tangentially with simulation, because I'm not there on a daily basis at all. But this whole idea of creativity, the creativity that you all have helped to spawn because simulation has this ability to um, go in so many different directions. And I just think it's amazing that we, I'm sure there's many more that I don't have up here. But even in my own small world, as I've gotten these requests that Marianne mentioned to use the rubric, you all and people who've asked to use the rubric have come up with amazing creative ways to use these resources. And I hope that that never ends. So keep up the good work there. And then of course, the study we all waited for, the NCSBN study that showed that up to 50% of clinical could be substituted with uh, simulation, which was great news for all of us, but especially for those of you who are operating in places where clinical placements are really hard to find, or the right kind of clinical placements are really hard to find. So we are really grateful for the work that was done to, um, to get to that. And that was a longitudinal study that extended into the first year of practice, so the, the proof really is there. So you may be asking at this point, so why are we talking about all this? What's, uh, how, how do new graduates' learning needs and, the simulation, and simulation science fit together with our community of colleagues and the theme of come together right now? Well, let me say to you that um, about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, I found this um, system, uh, this graphic of a system. And I looked at this, and it was actually in an educational organizational development book or something. Hoy and Miskel, some of you may know that, I don't know. Um, but I thought, okay, this is good. This to me looks like what we do in nursing education. And I was particularly taken by the word transformation because I was considering myself at that time that what had happened to me in nursing education, in my own basic education, was that my thinking had been transformed. I was a different person coming out of nursing school than I was going in. And I'm not really an autom uh, automatistic kind of individual, but I could see this idea of input, output. This is what we do. And so I thought, well, let me see if I can expand this a little bit. I also want you to notice the environment uh, lurking out there outside of the system, but having a great influence on the system. So I began to ex uh, explode this a little bit. Nursing education is a system. Okay, so we've got inputs of students, faculty, mission, budget, resources, including simulation resources. Students are transformed through the nursing education process to hopefully become competent graduates, prepared for the healthcare workforce. So we do our work and we do our work well. But why are we getting the statistics that we're getting that I presented at the front end of this, uh, of this discussion? And I think the missing element for me was this. I looked at this and I thought, well, when was the last time I spoke to somebody who hires our new graduates about what's really needed out there in the workplace? When was the last time they asked me about what our students are learning? And it just occurred to me, this is what we need to develop. This is one of the keys, I think, to helping our students move into that transition to practice, smooth transition to practice. So what's holding us back? Well, uh, we use this uh, four-letter word, silo, quite often. Um, there's four of them there, and I would say this could be our um, campus at OHSU. We've got a school of nursing, a school of medicine, a school of dentistry, a school of pharmacy, a college of pharmacy. We all operate in our own little silos until recently when we began on an IPE adventure. 
But I would say even within nursing education, you can put academic education in one of those silos, you can put practice education in another silo, you can put our other professional colleagues in another silo. We operate in silos, and so I'm gonna implore you to bust out of your silo today and figure out how we can help our students and our new graduates and how can simulation help us in the process. So I've got some ideas for you to contemplate, and then I'm gonna give you a little time to explore your own ideas about how we might come together, bust out of our silos, and think more about how we can help our students make that transition to practice. So in our own programs, here are some ideas that I've come up with. I'm sure there are many more that you can come up with. But if you have not yet worked with your simulation faculty, if you have designated faculty, I know many programs do not, and you, every, every faculty member is part of the simulation faculty, so um, that's great, I think. But for those of you who have designated simulation faculty, in our world, those simulation faculty and the simulation center are half an hour walk away. A tram ride, the tram you saw in that first picture, and then a 20 minute walk from there. Um, so we're not next door neighbors, we're not down the hall. So you have to make an effort sometimes. So I would say if you have designated, um, designated simulation faculty, chances are they're not experts in every field of nursing that you want your students exposed to. They need your help as content experts. So offer that, especially if you're a, a, a person that you know they don't have the kind of expertise that you have. A basic thing we can all do is instead of down, uh, bad talking or, or uh, bad mouthing simulation as a waste of time or whatever else you might say about it, that we can affirm the, the value of simulation. There's no question that students are terrified to go to simulation. I mean, we know that. We've, we've, that's part of simulation science that we've uncovered. So we need to affirm the value of simulation to those students and let them know what it is that this is going to help them in the long run. If you have not fully integrated simulation into the courses that you're teaching, invite the, simu the designated simulation faculty to come and join you for course meetings. I love the NLN's new, well, it's not so new anymore, the 2015 vision about debriefing across the curriculum because it really honors the skill that those of you in simulation now have as far as debriefers and can teach the rest of us. Because the rest of us, there's a lot of evidence to show that we don't ask very good questions and we don't always give very good feedback and that's one thing I think debriefing does really, really well. So call on your colleagues to help them, help you become a better debriefer in other places other than simulation. I think there's a real role for remediation in simulation, using simulation. And then I love the idea of uncovering students' unique learning needs. One of my colleagues, Stephanie Sedaris, who's at our Ashland campus, 300 miles from Portland, has gathered her faculty who are not part of simulation normally, and the students go through benchmarking simulations periodically during their uh, time in program. And the one that I'm especially fond of is the one that happens before they go to their capstone course, where the faculty who will be teaching them uh, can really see what their strengths are and what their learning needs are and can really work with them in those last terms to uncover and to grow those deeds into strengths. I just think that's a marvelous. And some of you were probably at um, Dr. Sedaris's and Dr. Ashley Franklin's um, presentation yesterday using multiple cases in simulation, which is a great way to go about that. Zooming out, developing academic practice collaboratives. Now this doesn't necessarily have to do with simulation directly, but it could. This is something we've actually just started doing on our campus. 66% um, of our graduates work at the university hospital after they graduate. And so we pulled together the professional practice leaders and the academic faculty, and we've been meeting quarterly. We are soon to have our fourth meeting um, about what this experience is like on both sides of the bridge. And honestly, it has made a huge difference just for us to get to know each other. I would say that our, our chief nursing officer and our dean have been talking for years, but that never gets down to where the rubber meets the road. So I would also say that hosting a new grad alum function would be an awesome way to get feedback about your program's preparation, about the simulation that was helpful to them and how, they might, uh, how you might have done things just a little differently. 
And then the whole idea of problem solving creatively. I love my Australian colleagues who admit 500 students at a time, and I'm thinking, how on earth do you do simulation with a 500 student cohort? Well, they have a lot of creative ways that they've uncovered, and one of the ways is what we're using for our study that Marianne mentioned. We actually have a simulated uh, recording, and the students respond to that. It's a recording of an expert role model. In fact, it's Dr. Stephanie Sedaris uh, doing her thing, but it's a, a role model of, of, a, of a patient and a nurse um, doing um, an intervention around a, a, a delirium patient. Delirium is something we don't get to spend a lot of time with in class. It's something that students will graduate without ever seeing. But in this video, they can see a patient with delirium and learn from that. Then I would encourage you to get involved with organizations. Of course, many of our journals, our nursing education journals that are not simulation focused also publish articles about simulation. And if you need to write an article about simulation or something you've tried, I would really encourage you to write an article, to get involved with organizations, to, um, let me go back to the article part, but to the number of the uh, journals that we have, nursing education journals, I won't name them because I'll leave one off, um, have a section for educational innov innovations. If you're doing some cool things with simulation, share it with us, for goodness sake. We really need to know this. This is part of being a colleague, a community of colleagues. If you're interested in research, in advancing the simulation, uh, the science of simulation, then reach out to people who you know are doing research and get involved with them. Um, I guess I'd like to hope that you can learn from me that you don't have to be in the same state or the same city. Uh, I've done simulation research, and, and a few years back, Ball State and our school did simulation uh, research with a colleague in England. Now I'm researching simulation uh, with colleagues in New Zealand and Australia. You don't have to be in digital technology and the new age of technology, which I know precious little about, but I know enough to make this happen. So it's all good. But reach out to them if that's of interest to you. And then I would say breaking down those silos between our um, professional colleagues and, um, and ourselves, that idea of getting together a collaboration. I would just remember back to about 2012 when we had a senior sim day, uh, uh, sorry, a code day in our campus for seniors. And the um, physician who came to help with that was actually a person who um, was our ER director. And he would be the person in charge for the code uh, because he was the doctor who came and that was the way that it was set up. Anyway, at the end of that session, the, um, the physician and, and one of our nurse uh, simulation specialists decided we need to do something more interprofessional here. And they came up with a whole course that preceded OHSU's efforts at a course. But it was because they had a relationship and they had grown to trust each other. And I guess I'm just saying to you, reach out to your colleagues across the aisle, across the campus, across the town, whatever, whatever it is that will help you to grow your students and to provide that seamless transition into practice. I love this quote from an accelerated student. Our accelerated program is 15 months long and sometimes I worry that they don't have time to breathe or pee, much less reflect. So, but I'm gonna just read it because I think this is the goal for all of us. I certainly hope so. Over the past year, I've come to realize that nursing school exists not so much to teach us the rote skills of nursing or even to fill our heads with an assortment of facts, though it accomplishes those tasks handily, but rather to baptize us into the profession, to help us think like nurses and believe we belong in their hallowed ranks. I love that. That keeps me going. So now it's your turn. So I'd like for you to spend a few minutes just thinking about a way that you can engage in a partnership or a colleagueship across some of these boundaries, silos if you will, with the goal of facilitating that transition to practice. What's one small thing that you can do that using simulation that will help to facilitate that? And you don't have to be a facilitation specialist. You could be somebody who just has special content knowledge or who wants to do something a little bit more. And then I'm going to ask you to share it with a neighbor. And while you're talking, there's going to be some inspirational music playing in the background. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> You've got it. 
and <laughs> our front rows in the know. <laughs> and then when the music stops, I'd like you to stop talking and I'll finish up, okay? So carry on, it's four minutes and 19 seconds, so you have a little time. Okay. <laughs> I wanted you to come together, now I want you to come to order. I am sure that you came up with lots of creative ideas, because I know this group, and I hope that over the next, uh, maybe even uh, in, during the question time, if you came up with a really good idea, you'd like to share it, that would be awesome. But I hope that even today you'll come up to me and tell me what ideas you had, because I'd love to add to my list. So 
the Beatles wrote this song in 1960, or they performed it in 1969, recorded it, I should say. 1969, many of you were, never bo were, were not born yet. Uh, it was a very funky time. And this is a very funky song. And if you Google this song, you'll learn that no one really knows what the words mean to this song. <laughs> about some guy with juju eyes and, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at the words, they make no sense whatsoever except for two phrases. One and one and one make three. That's good to confirm, isn't it? <laughs> and the idea of coming together right now. And I posit to you that we are operating in healthcare in crazy times, in funky times, if you will. And our salvation is in coming together and working together and crossing over those silos and working with our colleagues. And I hope that you will find that uh, a helpful thing to consider and to continue to think about. So as we close, I just want to say that um, I hope that I've inspired those of you who haven't been involved in simulation here to four to play a role, even if it's just affirming simulation to your students. But to be continually thinking as you teach, what is it that students need to know in practice? and to teach in that intentional way so that when they're using SBAR, that they are getting through the full uh, acronym, the SBAR, and that you're using those four needs that we uncovered in our small study that to understand what it is that new graduates need to know in practice. They're not going to be with us forever as much as we would like some of them to be with us forever, not all of them. <laughs> But the idea is that we want them to be ready for practice when it's time for them to be ready to, for practice. It's been a delight to talk to you. I hope that some of you have some questions or have some comments. There's microphones in each of the aisles. So I'd ask if you have a question or you want to share an idea, please proceed to the microphones. Thanks so much. Okay, hi. Good morning, thank you so much for um, all your great ideas, Kathy. My pleasure. I'm Sarah Camp, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, doing a lot of simulation there and at Belmont University. And I'm doing a pilot study for my doctoral project on using simulation for clinical remediation. And I heard you mention that you think simulation is, can be a, used for remediation purposes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I wondered if you could talk more about it. <laughs> Remember, so I can I'm, not quote a, it. I'm not a hands on uh, simulation person, but I just think it offers um, students who are struggling a way to break down what they're, what they're thinking and what they're doing. And, and it's, again, there's no, hopefully, there's no pressure in remediation to perform as there would be in a real life situ situation. And that by doing that and by querying them along the way, so tell me what the next step is. Why do you say that? Really helping, maybe even debriefing them as they go through the process. I am sure that some of my simulation colleagues who are in the trenches every day have some really great <laughs> ideas about that. Um, so I would really recommend that you talk to them. But I, I just think it's ripe for remediation. It's just an awesome strategy. I do know that at Oregon, we in the past, and I don't know if we are still doing this, um, that we used to uh, contract with the State Board of Nursing to help our foreign-born nurses who were trying to get their licenses in Oregon and helping them work through the process of, re of review, not remediation so much, but review in order for them to be able to pass the licensure exam. So that sort of spawned that idea, and I've heard of others who are doing remediation. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Good morning, my name is Beth Stuckey and I am a curriculum developer with Western Governors University. Um, the next step beyond high fidelity simulation is virtual simulation. Could you address that topic? What are you seeing? What are some of the lessons that you've learned with high fidelity simulation uh, and how would you apply that to virtual simulation? Thank well, and I guess I would add that um, I've seen our simulation faculty going more and more to standardized patients for certain kinds of applications. So I don't know too much about virtual simulation. I have to say I have uh, participated in it to get my BLS recertification, 
and I thought it was great once I figured it out. And I know there have been a number of studies that have been done that show that um, there have been some studies that they're kind of equivocal. Some studies have shown that they're equal in terms of their outcomes, and others have shown that the high-fidelity simulation has better outcomes, but maybe just slightly, maybe not statistically significantly different. So that's about what I know about uh, virtual simulation. That's, that's about it. I, again, I'm sure there are experts in the room who could answer that question better than I. Yes, in the middle. Good morning. I'm Hi. Kayla Crowbarger, and uh, I am using your um, rubric for my dissertation study on transference of clinical judgment to simulation to the clinical setting. So thank you for permission for that. My Thanks. question is about, um, <clears throat> I've met some resistance from our uh, simulation team to be d developing a collaboration more with faculty as far as meeting and making discussions about how can we improve, where are we going, what are the best guidelines, how do we remediate adjunct faculty and others who maybe only do it once in a while. Uh, we don't have dedicated faculty for simulation. So mm -hmm. could you maybe provide some direction as how to maybe bring a cohesiveness together with that? Thank you. Sure, thanks for your question. I, I honestly think that if we are all together on the same page of trying to prepare our students to become the best nurses they can be right out of the chute, that should bring people together and get over those petty conflicts and that sort of thing. I, I really think that that's a shared value that we need to espouse and that we need to have in our schools of nursing. And that really, honestly, that's the best thing I can say. I think if, if we're, it's like taking care of patients. If we're all trying to do the best by our patient, then why should we have a squabble over this, that, or the other thing, that this is my turf, no, this is your turf. It's very similar, very similar. So getting everybody on the same page as to why we're doing this. What is it that we're about? What is our output, if you will, using the input-output model? And how can we make that output a better quality? That's really the central focus of what we're about. Yes, you're welcome. Good morning. Yep. I'm Rume Alexander from UNC. Hi, Rume. Hi, <laughs> UNC Chapel Hill. Yep. And you're president-elect. I have a suggestion oh, good. Uh, for the audience and maybe to add to your list, which you may, it may be there already. We use poverty simulation as a means of helping students to understand other environments. Yep. That, and since there can be so many coexisting environments. And so I suggest that you work uh, with some of your local agencies who are happy to stage those simulations for you and involve your faculty, staff, and your students. It yep. gives you a chance to debrief, to reflect, and to understand that there are a set of rules for people who are just trying to make it from day to day and who would make decisions very different from another set of decisions should they have the resources and et cetera. You can involve other professions and make it interprofessional and it is quite a growth experience. It usually takes three or four hours to do, mm -hmm. but it is well worth your time. So that's a suggestion. Thanks, Rume. I actually wholeheartedly support that suggestion. We have used poverty simulation, which I believe comes out of Kansas. There's uh, materials that you can get um, through Kansas, but, but it's a whole group kind of simulation. It's amazing. But I would add further to your recommendation that that poverty simulation actually be, and this is speaking as a population nurse, that that actually be at the front end of your curriculum. Because I don't know about your hospitals, but we are seeing more and more um, clients with comorbidities and many challenges right from the get-go. And students who are either 18, which none of ours are, but uh, or, or perhaps just have never had to uh, be exposed to people who are who are experiencing poverty, that a poverty simulation will open their eyes and help them to think differently. There's some great tools out there for, for simulation. We use volunteers as well. We use community people and we use volunteers. My husband has volunteered as one of the storekeepers and yeah, we, we do all kinds of fun things. So, one more question. Um, somebody mentioned uh, virtual, we have a robot that students can oh, cool. uh, manipulate. But my question to you is, your open, opening statement about students and competence 
have you tested Benner's theory with simulation? In other words, does simulation move the student through Benner's phases? Because when you presented, well, two and a half years, they're still working on it, that's what she said. And I'm wondering if simulation would move the process quicker. I don't know of a study that has actually worked through the Benner um, phases. Do you, Susie? No. But I will just say to you that the rubric that I developed, actually, uh, I used different words than, than Benner's phases because I wanted to kind of not separate myself, but, but not try to confuse people with using the same terms. And, and we definitely have seen that students do move in a trajectory toward excellence. Um, as they work through simulation. But I don't know of any program that, where we could actually test that fully because there's no program I know of that um, is, you know, 100% simulation. So, but I think their experiences in simulation as well as in clinical and classroom and just learning in general, all the different variables that come into their learning certainly do support their development over time, um, as I've seen it with the rubric that I developed. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate your sharing uh, your insights. Thank you. Well done. Thanks so much. It was fun. Yes, and we, we, on behalf of this wonderful audience, thank you so much for the time and dedication that you put in to building our community of colleagues, from thinking about it from both practice and education mm -hmm. viewpoints, and helping us to think about interprofessional um, simulation and our way forward. I want to also extend my thanks to Lairdall for making this session mm -hmm. possible and, so, and for partnering with us in so many ways. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Lairdall has been a supporter with the NLN since 2003, and it's been a privilege and work to pleasure and a pleasure to work with our Lairdall colleagues. Now I invite David Johnson, who figured this out before I did, um, to get on stage. And um, he's a member of the NLN Board of Governors, and he's going to make a special presentation. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. come to a very special moment, a moment for me as the president and a moment for this organization. And that's the presentation of the NLN President's Award to Clive Patrickson. He's just retired as the CEO of Lairdall, but he hasn't retired from our lives and for the mission of good simulation. And even before the origin of the Spunt Lectures, the NLN and Lairdall co-created a strategic partnership. The leadership of this partnership has led us to new horizons and many, many joint accomplishments. In collaboration with Lairdall, rests with Clive. He's made it possible. Our strategic partnership was his vision. He saw it before we did. Together with Lairdall's chairman and current CEO, Tor Lairdall, Clive provided the energy and the foresight to recognize the partnerships built solidly on the NLN's pedagogical expertise with Lairdall's commitment through quality simulation resources would take both organizations to new places, places we could not go alone. Clive understands our community of colleagues. Throughout his career at Lairdall, Clive led the organization to become partners with a family of organizations. For example, the American Heart Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Topago, and of course, our own collaboration. With Clive's leadership, 
mutual respect, and shared values have been the foundation of our relationships, and they are the key to the long-term success that has been complementary in nature to both of our missions. Together with colleagues, Alf Christian Dubal, CEO of Lairdal, and David Johnson, President of Lairdal of the Americas, Clive spearheaded the development and implementation of so many faculty resources for nurse educators. For, from the simulation NLN scenarios, vSIM for nursing, SESIN or simulation solutions for nursing education, and now NLN's accelerating to practice program. It all started with an incredible woman from Texas, and we know that good things come from Texas. <laughs> Rosie Patterson, who by the way of introduction built a bridge in 2003 with the NLN. Clive is then president of Lairdal of the Americas, did not hesitate to cross the bridge and build an enduring and sustaining partnership with the NLN. As we have said so often over the years, Clive has always had our back. Colleagues, it's my pleasure and honor to present the NLN's award from the President's Award to Clive Patrickson. Please join me in giving Clive a grand hand. So, um, you don't know how important that last presentation was to me because there's so many things uh, I can say and some of the thoughts that I have. But first of all, let me thank the, the president, the board, and the staff of the NLN for this. But I'm not certain that it's deserved at all. The reason I say that this, uh, this uh, last presentation resonated was for many reasons, but the first of all being I was born in Liverpool in 1956. <laughs> so I, brought, I grew up in those funky times, <laughs> right where the Beatles were. But I'm now living in Melbourne. And I woke one day, about four or five months ago, and I received, and received an email, and it told me I'd got this award. And I sort of, first thing I did was pinch myself. Then I said, this has got to be a spoof. Um, of course, it was the middle of the night in Washington, so I couldn't phone Bev and Asta, although I was tempted to do at the time. So I asked myself why. Because, and the reason I'm saying that I'm not certain about, the, uh, about this being the right thing for me was because, unlike you all, I don't spend hours treating patients. I also don't spend hours teaching thousands of students to be better nurses. I'm not the lifesaver, you are. And so my contribution and the contribution of Laird or the organization I represent has been to do little more than try to help. If we've done that and we've helped save um, thousands of lives through you, then we've made a contribution. But I have to go back 14 years, and I promise that I'll be quick with this, but it, there, really there's a couple of things that need to be said. I, I go back 14 years. And for those who count in Malone years, this is four years BB, before Bev. <laughs> uh, if you can remember that far back. I was, I was being pulled by my close colleague, as the president said, Rosie Patterson, to a meeting in an austere building down on Broadway in New York it, to an organization with a very strange name called a league. Well, I'm only used to football leagues, basketball leagues, and swimming leagues, so this was a novelty for me. And I was ushered up to the boardroom where I was, uh, where there were, I was greeted by two people with wonderful, brilliant, smiling faces. 
These were Terry Verliga and Marianne Rizzolo. Well, that turned out to be a fantastic uh, meeting, and this was, a, this was the start of a journey. But a couple of miracles happened on this, uh, on, on this journey for the last 14 years. The first of them happened that day. It was a miracle that Terry and, Mary, uh, Terry and Marianne didn't scare me away. And the second thing was, it was even more of a miracle that I didn't scare them away. So, what was that? so on that day, what was born was a project. And this was referred to in the last presentation. That was the birth of the project. And the project came from Terry and, Mar Terry and Marianne saying to me, we need to we, our nurses need to know how to integrate simulation into the curriculum. This was about 2003, and I can tell you that, as we saw in the last presentation, it was extremely novel at that time. SimMan had only been introduced two years before, and up until 2000, there was only around about 400 simulators in the whole world. So this was at a really breakthrough time, and the project was born that led to Pam Jeffries, and it led to a report, it led to a book, and it led to many more projects. But it really wasn't about the projects it's, that was born that day, it was about the relationships, and what followed were activities like SIRC and vSIM and the seminal work by Marilyn and Orman and Susie Egren around low-dose high-frequency learning, which will be really key for the future of healthcare. But it was more than that, it was a friendship. And that was at the time, and again, it, the relevance of this morning is particularly important because that was the time when Deb Spunt came to the forefront in that project with, with uh, with Pam Jeffries. So let me fast forward. Four years on, and we're now in the year zero BB. And the, N the NLN tells me, four years on, that the CEO is leaving. And they're on a hunt, a hunt for a new CEO. So let me tell you what my PhD was in. My PhD in academic research at the time was in interorganizational relationships. One of the key findings of my PhD was, when you have a change in leadership, then you have a period of vulnerability of the, uh, between the organizations. So I was worried. Finally, I got to, I was introduced to the new, new CEO, this pocket rocket, and I was <laughs> extremely worried that I was not gonna be able to keep up. And I'm still worried every time I come to see her. <laughs> so, what then? Well, this is when the second miracle arrived. Um, and the survival of this relationship happened despite my pranks, I can tell you. We were at this event in Las Vegas, and the foundation, doing its good causes, was raising funds. It was, uh, they were holding a karaoke night. I don't know how many of you were there. They were holding a karaoke night. And there was all sorts of noise and bad singing and it was terrible. <laughs> but we were participating in full throttle and I foolishly, in a career limiting move, <laughs> turned to Bev and said, I'll tell you what, if you, if you sing, I'll give you $5,000. And I thought, I've, what a safe bet this is. <laughs> I was wrong. So she, go, she, she goes over to the mic, pulls the mic and says, and then to, pre, uh, pre, goes on with a, a uh, rendition of Aretha Franklin's respect that I've, better than I've ever seen in my
In Aladdin, I found a home. I found a family, I found a passion, and I found a commitment to working to help save lives and make the lives of Americans better every single day. What better hobby could somebody like me have but working with an organization like this? This isn't an award for me, but for the relationship between two wonderful organizations that I've grown to love and respect, which is that for which I worked, which was Laodal Medical, and for the National League of Nursing. If I, have to, if I have helped just a little, if I've helped just a little to contribute to this organization and what it does for patients and nurses, then mission accomplished. I salute everybody in this room, all it does and the people it serves. And my contribution is small and your contribution is so great. Thanks very much for everything that you do for America. Thank you, Clive. Now you know how our hearts are touched in our interactions with Clive and with the Lairdall family. It's a part of who we all are, here and now and going forward. So I want to thank you for coming this morning. We'll see you back here following a break for the National Faculty Meeting. And that's an important one. It's one we really hear from all of you. So take a break. They're going to move the chairs around, and we'll be off again pretty soon.